was so good and it made me cry. And if they don't, well, friendship over. This woman can write. This is not gonna be a book for you. Well done, Sanderson. <laughs> and I loved it. <laughs> Tis the season to rant and rave. Today, we are raving. <laughs> My top 10 best books of 2021. These are not books that came out necessarily in 2021. These are books that I read in 2021. And this list is, as always, according to me and my opinions. So I did my best to rank them. Uh, as usual, the middle bit is uh, not super married to that order, but the top is the top. And the bottom of my best books of the year is the bottom. So in the middle, it's more... It could go different ways. <laughs> Again, as usual, let's do the worst best to the best best. And on an extra positive note. <laughs> Number 10 on my list is Malibu Rising by Taylor Jenkins Reid. This is Taylor Jenkins Reid's new book. This actually did come out in 2021. And Taylor Jenkins Reid has become an autobiography for me. I picked up uh, The Seven Husbands of Evil and Hugo because everyone and their mother was raving about it. Even people who don't read lit fic were like, this book though. And I was like, well, if everyone seems to like it, every type of reader seems to like it. Sans reason, I'll, I probably won't hate it. And I loved it. Balled my eyes out. I was like, okay, okay. So when people were raving about her next book, Daisy Jones and the Six, I was like, well, wouldn't normally pick that up, but she didn't let me down with Seven Husbands. People like this too. I'll read that too. And I loved it. <laughs> so when Malibu Rising was coming out, I was like, I mean, literally, if anyone else was writing this, I'd be like, nope. <laughs> A book about surfers in the 80s? Just absolutely not my thing. But I was like, Taylor, you haven't let me down yet. So I will read this as well. And I loved it. I don't think, I think of the three books from her, it's probably my least favorite, but an absolutely fantastic book regardless. And I absolutely would not like a book about servers written by anybody else. I mean, I guess it's possible there's another Taylor out there, but she just is so amazing at weaving a portrait of characters in such a short amount of time, of, of lots of characters and very real, fully fleshed out feeling characters that you really care about them and their stories in a very short amount of time. Because you feel like you've really lived with them, even though these are all standalone books and they are relatively short. So. The amount of time you actually spend with them isn't that long, but she writes them so vividly, so poignantly, so realistically that you just, you believe in them and they feel real to you. And once again, she did that with Malibu Rising. Again, I think I like Seven Husbands and Daisy Jones a little bit better, both of them, but Malibu Rising was still great and I absolutely deserve to be on my best books of the year. Next up I have a Brandon Sanderson book, Skyward. <laughs> Uh, I have a video up, uh, not a review, but um, talking about why Skyward might secretly be Name of the Wind, which was a video done tongue in cheek. Like, don't actually take me seriously on that. I don't take that seriously. But anyway, Skyward, his, the first in his YA sci-fi series. And it was just a good time. It was a really good time. I binge read it. I didn't even plan to pick it up at all. It wasn't on my TBR. But uh, Jess and Jesse and Elle were hosting a read along in anticipation of the release of Satanic. And I was like, all right, I've been meaning to read Skyward for forever. Let's freaking do it. And I didn't, I haven't read Star Side or Cytonic yet, but uh, Skyward, I just, I couldn't put it down. I really enjoyed it. I feel like a lot of the things that I tend to zero in on as flaws in his other books and his adult fantasy books, these are things that are still present in Skyward, but they are appropriate for Skyward. So having slightly more juvenile characters, it's a YA sci-fi series. Our main character is young. Having quite modern uh, and simple dialogue, this is a sci-fi series where our main character is a teenager. <laughs> so like the his storytelling isn't actually that different in Skyward as it is from other stories, but because of the setting, because of the audience it's geared towards, because of the type of the type of story that it is, those are no longer flaws, if that makes sense. This is where this fits, this is appropriate. And I was like, yeah, well, here, yeah, that's what goes here. <laughs> Even the thing that I thought I would hate, the like animal companion slug thing. That was so cute. I did hate the fake square word that is in it. I almost always hate that. And it always feels fake and stupid to me. Like literally almost docked an entire star for that. But overall, could not put it down. And I'm very excited to read Star Sight. So this is a win for me. Um, well done, Sanderson. <laughs> Next up, I have Deathless Divide by Justina Ireland. Um, I read the first book, Dread Nation, in 2020. Uh, and I read Deathless Divide um, with Mara, who had already read Dread Nation and had not yet read this. So we better read the second one together. And we both really, really loved it. Um, I think we both thought the first one was slightly better, but it was more to do with just sort of pacing issues. The second one has a big time jump in the middle, so it kind of feels weirdly segmented, where it's sort of like two books in one. So we kind of felt like 
how that was broken up may not have made a lot of sense. It's kind of jarring to have that like gap in the middle. But overall, it was an amazing conclusion to the duology. This duology, I think, is a masterclass in what both YA and alternate history fantasy has the capacity to be. If you don't know anything about this duology, it is a YA alternate history uh, fantasy, I guess. I mean, it's a zombie book, I guess. Alternate history horror, where uh, it asks the question, what if uh, there had been a zombie apocalypse during the Civil War? So I think it tackles questions that are from a more like historical world building perspective extremely well. Like, okay, what, what would that look like? How would society, the way that it was back then, have reacted to the presence of zombies? How they would have reorganized society or dealing with that? how this would have influenced and affected what and how, like what they did with and how they handled the having of slaves and how they would repurpose slaves to address this issue, how this could present both hardship and opportunity for the people involved, how it would change the civil war itself and the trajectory of like of America's development. So like just from like a, again, world building and history perspective, this is how you do it. Forget that it's YA, like alternate history fantasy is one of those tricky things to do but I think you really have to pay attention to that detail and really do that thought exercise not just do things willy-nilly if you want it to feel real and she did it was amazing and then the story itself the characters it's again an, a fantastic example of like just how real and gritty and dark YA can be while still absolutely being YA. Like it doesn't feel like, well, this should have been marketed as adult. I think adults can definitely read it and enjoy it. I did. But it feels like it's it's still for a YA audience the way that it presents these things. It doesn't shy away from presenting the dark side of slavery, of racism, of zombies. <laughs> but it handles them in a way that is still appropriate and palatable for a slightly younger audience. And it is just chef's kiss. And the main character, again, is a fantastic example of having a feisty main character that doesn't become a caricature. Like she's sassy and she can be stubborn, but that does get in her way and that does have negative impacts on her. She isn't just like a sassy YA character. Like she actually feels like a flesh and blood human being that's dealing with some real issues, some dark things. And the people around her also were very well written. And just the whole, the whole project of it was executed so well. And it's just compellingly written. Like it's so intensely readable. I hate zombies. I avoid zombies at all costs, but I picked this up because I heard such great things about it and it did not disappoint. Highly, highly recommend this duology. It is so good. <laughs> Next up, I have Guns of the Dawn by Adrian Tchaikovsky. So, <laughs> well, on my worst books of the year is a book that Alan picked for me, but on my best books of the year, there's a book that Alan picked for me. So, high highs and low lows. <laughs> I liked Guns of the Dawn so much that I picked it as my pick for January's Blaze and Bodice Rippers book club pick because I am certain that the ladies will like this as well. And if they don't, well, friendship over. <laughs> Guns of the Dawn is, it, it, I, almost, I keep wanting to accidentally categorize it as alternate history fantasy. It is not actually, it is just heavily inspired by histor like historical place and time. It feels very much like sort of like revolutionary war era. It is flintlock fantasy, but it does, it isn't actually like England during the Revolutionary War. It is a fantasy world with like a fantasy country and fantasy problems and etc. But it's very much that vibe. And it is, <laughs> uh, I think Alan compared it to Downton Abbey. Um, I mean, Downton Abbey is the wrong era. Uh, I would more liken it to like Poldark or something. Uh, it feels, you know, very like that, that relationship kind of drama, at least in the beginning. And then the whole rest of the book is war. And the war and the battle is written extremely well. It's a standalone book, which is always refreshing <laughs> in fantasy. I think the world building is done very well. Uh, you didn't have to do it too much of it because, you know, it leans on you recognizing Revolutionary War era type, type sort of aesthetic and political, social norms, etc. And it, it executes them well. So if this was historical, like alternate history fantasy, like it wouldn't be too far off the mark as it is. But there's magic in it, so we weave magic into it as well. I mean, you could go the route of having it be alternate history fantasy that includes magic, but it's not, it's a fantasy of its own world. So I just, I feel like, yeah, it just kind of has it all because it has this sort of a social relationship drama, there's family drama, there's like romantic uh, Lizzie Darcy or like Thornton and what's her name from North and South, that kind of a situation. There's also like epic war and there's political intrigue and there's magic uh, because like magic is part of the war. And uh, yeah, it's just, it's got it all. I really, really thoroughly enjoyed it. I'm so glad Alan picked it for me. Like I was, when he talked about it, I was generally interested in it. So I probably would have picked it up 
eventually, but I'm so glad that, you know, I was made to pick it up sooner rather than later. And I'm excited to reread it in January. Next up, I have Girl in the Tower by Catherine Arden. This is the second book in the Winter Night trilogy. Um, I reread The Bear in the Nightingale this year, and then I finally got around to reading Girl in the Tower and The Winter of the Witch. Winter of the Witch is not on this list. Winter of the Witch is still very, very good. I don't want to say that it's not. But of the three books in the trilogy, the second one is my favorite. I think the whole trilogy is excellent without a doubt. But the second book, I just feel like is peak everything that I love about it. I love the main character Vasya. She is such an exceptional heroine, feisty and independent without that being kind of like an overdone cliche. The Russian vibes are just off the charts. Excellently well done by Catherine Arden in terms of making it authentic and real. Lots of transliterated Russian that it makes it even more authentic, but the clothes, the food, the way they talk, the way they behave, the folkloric elements, it is just like as Russian-y and Rus Russian-ish as you can get without like reading a book in Russian <laughs> about Russia. And it is, it, it is, the second book, it maintains the magic and whimsy and wonder of Bear and the Nightingale while still raising the stakes and making this a little darker, a little more real and involving more of the characters that you did meet some of in the first book, but sort of expanding things and escalating things. And it was just an absolute page turner. I didn't expect a book in the Winter Night trilogy to be I, they're immersive, but I didn't expect it to be a page turner the way that the girl in the tower was. And I just, I got sucked in and I loved it. So, so good. The third book, great too, but the second book, so good. Next up, I have The Hundred Thousand Kingdoms by N.K. Jemisin. And N.K. Jemisin, oh my word, this woman can write. I am just staggered every time I pick up a book by her. I read the Broken Earth trilogy and then I intended the uh, is it the dreamer duology? It begins with the killing moon. Is that what it's called? Well, whatever to be my next one. But then my patrons picked hundred thousand kingdoms as a buddy read. So we went with that. And it was written before broken earth. Um, so it was interesting kind of going backwards and seeing a lot of sort of like prototype versions of some ideas that are much more further explored in broken earth trilogy, sort of seeing the seeds of those ideas where like some directions she's clearly interested in going and sort of like beginning to kind of like tease those directions or dip her toes in those directions and then again knowing where that interest kind of gets like fully fleshed out and like leaned into in Broken Earth. So it's kind of fun to see hints of what was to come in this earlier work but it was once again just an absolutely staggering example of utterly original world building. It does not feel like it's it, like that it's derivative or or imitating anything else and not that that's always a bad thing. I mean there's certainly a book great books that are heavily inspired and intended to be read as being inspired by specific places and specific times. And that is absolutely their intent is for you to pick up on that. But I think it's much harder to find truly original world building where it doesn't feel like, oh, okay, well, so you've basically taken X, Y, Z and then like made it fantasy. And it also doesn't feel like, oh, like you are basically imitating another fantasy author. Like, oh, this isn't just like a Tolkien redux or this isn't, you know, etc. Like it doesn't feel like anything else. It's its own thing in a way that is so utterly uniquely Jemison. And like the authorial voice is distinct. And if you don't like Jemison's authorial voice, well, you, there's no getting away from that. But it's just a unique way, both of building your world and of telling the story, like the way that she tells the story to you, like the way that you come to know the story is also so inventive and un unusual. The way you come to the story, the way you come to know the character, the way you come to know what's going on, is also different. It doesn't feel like, and here's the part where we get this, and here's the part where we get this, and this is the part where they explain that. Like, all of it feels fresh and new and innovative and and captivating and I, again very bingeable. And I just cannot put it down when I read a Jemison book because I'm just like, wow, what is any of this? I must know. So highly recommend. I can't wait. The other books in the series are kind of like it's like a trilogy of standalones that all are like tangentially connected to each other. So it's not a direct sequel, but I'm very excited to read the second and third books in the Inheritance trilogy. Next up, I have a very new edition, uh, The Declaration of the Rights of Magicians by H.G. Perry. I very recently read this and even more recently read the second book, A Radical Act of Free Magic. Of the two books, I think the first one is slightly stronger, but as a duology, I kind of want to put just like the duology on my best of the year. And again, sort of like what I was saying about Deathless Divide, doing alternate history fantasy is hard. And if you think that it's easy, if you think that, oh, well, that's much easier because then I don't have to invent my own world and I can just kind of like piggyback off of what actually happened in history. If that's how you've approached it, which many authors have, that's wrong. <laughs> it is just as difficult, if not more difficult, to properly do alternate history fantasy. Because to properly do the thought exercise of not only how that place and time would be 
different if it had this new element, be it magic or zombies or whatever. Also how the having of that would then have a ripple effect and change how things have happened. Or if they didn't change how things happened, uh, or if they didn't change what things happened, they would have to change how those things happened. So that, that even if history ended up still bending to the same arc that we know, it would still have to have a new reason to come to that, if that makes sense. So um, I think this is just an absolute masterclass in how to do that correctly. And I know this book doesn't have as high ratings as other books, and I think that's partly to do with how much care and attention is paid to the historical time and place and how history itself is being reshaped by magic or is being recontextualized or reimagined with the inclusion of magic. So this isn't like big, huge, sweeping battles of sorcery on the streets of London and a lot of nonsense that feels stupid and unreal. The having of magic by itself is has a massive butterfly effect for everything in your world, which is why like a lot of big epic fantasies that have a lot of big world building with big magic, I'm like, I don't think you've thought this through. Because even the smallest change, the tiniest magical addition, the tiniest thing to change the realities, the natural laws of your universe has intense ripple effects. So anyway, a lot of the book kind of deals with, uh, if you don't know anything about it, it takes place sort of um, in the Enlightenment era. So we follow William Pitt and Wilberforce and, and then in France we follow Robespierre. Um, in the colonies we follow uh, Toussaint Levorteur and they are all sort of, I mean, the figures that you know from history. However, this is a world in which magic exists. And so a lot of the questions that were being grappled with in the in reality in that time and place in history to do with people's individual rights, the rights of the common man, the rights of slaves, the questions of abolition, these are all sort of reframed to include or to be instead about magic and commoners having the ability to have access to and use their magic and enslaved peoples being enslaved for magic by magic and whether or not they have a right to use their own magic. And so the debates that would have been happening in the House of Commons or in Parliament, um, the kind of bills that were being put forth, the kind of debates that were going on about whether you give rights to people or you don't give rights to people, then we have war, you know, and so in wartime then you give extra rights to people, but then how do you take them back? Do you take them back? Is there any taking them back once you've given people rights to have access to their magic? And it's just, it's so well done reimagining and reframing everything with the inclusion of this question of magic. So I just thought it was, it was so good. And I think the characters were actually, I mean, even though it was a little bit more dry, a little more like history, I really felt myself extremely attached to in particular Pitt and Wilberforce. Their relationship is very well painted by the author. Uh, I really feel, it feels like a very real friendship in, and not just in a way of because of like what you know about history, but I mean, you really feel it between them, how much loyalty and trust there is and how much it hurts when that's shaken because they'll end up on opposing sides of a debate uh, now and again, but how much faith and trust and love there is between them regardless and how that's great, but also that's what makes it hurt so much if they're not on the same page about something. It's just so well done. I see why it's not that popular because again, if you don't want a book to be about like people debating a bill in the House of Commons, uh, this is not gonna be a book for you. But if you are a nerd about this kind of thing and you also like a bit of magical flair, cannot recommend highly enough. We're down to my top three now. So third is Ship of Magic by Robin Hobb. This was so good. I was so excited to start the Live Ship Trader series with Mara. Uh, and this month I will be reading Mad Ship, but I haven't read that yet. So maybe that's even better, but you know, I, I'm i sorry. <laughs> it missed my personal cutoff of I'm filming this today, but I've just been loving Hob so, so much. It was a toss up between putting this and Royal Assassin on the list. And I chose Ship of Magic, one, because I read it more recently. And two, because while I adored Royal Assassin, I think, just from a writing craft perspective, I think Ship of Magic demonstrates like the next step in Robin Hobbs like writing journey. I mean, it's not like she's an up and coming author, but like, I mean, she's take she wrote a trilogy about Fitzfarseer and it was all from his perspective and it was an amazing deep dive into that main character. But now telling a story with multiple perspectives, interweaving perspectives, overlapping perspectives, that's like a whole different ball game. That is a new level of difficulty that I feel like is, not that it's a, it's better, but it's harder. So I don't know yet. I've only read Ship of Magic. I don't know yet if Live Ship Traders will end up being a series that I love more than the Farseer trilogy. I just spent so much time with Farseer that like right now that's closer to my heart. But I think Ship of Magic just demonstrated Hobbes ability to just like turn things up, expand them, 
do them in new and fresh ways, introduce fresh new characters, expand her world, show you more, and not just leaning on the fact that she wrote Farseer, but showing you a completely different part of this world that is almost unrelated to Farseer and still weaving in hints of what she'd written before. It just, it just shows a level of craft that I think does it, is why it's on here instead of Royal Assassin. Even the Royal Assassin has my whole heart. Night Eyes has my whole heart. But Ship of Magic was just like watching what was a very promising bud fully bloom. And it's so impressive. Chef's Kiss, highly recommend, cannot wait to read Mad Ship. Number two is Empire of Silence by Christopher Rocchio. I read all of what's released in the Sun Eater series with Alex this year. Uh, we have live shows on our channels about the individual books and we are super stoked for the fourth installment which comes out next um, spring, I think in March. But uh, Empire of Silence, I think people told me and Alex um, that the books get better and better and that Empire of Silence is the weak one. And I mean, I remember being shocked by that and being like, well, Empire of Silence was like 10 out of 10. I don't know how you get better than that. And I, I mean, I gave every book in the series so far 10 out of 10, 5 out of 5, like knockouts. But I think my favorite probably is Empire of Silence. Um, and, it's, and, and I do not mean to suggest that the second and third books are like now steps down or like it's like going down in quality. I absolutely do not mean that. But there's just something about the beginning of the series where you first come to know all of this. You first come to know the characters. You first come to know this world. There is just something so, I don't I don't know if there's a word for it, but that's what makes it my, my favorite, I think, so far is just coming to this world and coming to know it for the first time. That like continuing to be in the world is a treat because it's well written and there's new and staggering things that you learn that completely recontextualize what you thought you knew. So it continues to be like mind boggling, but you can't really repeat that, like that first high, if that makes sense, of like this first introduction to this world and being like, wow. <laughs> uh, kind of similarly to the Broken Earth trilogy, I had that experience where the fifth season like is probably my favorite, but it's partly just because like that's your first time seeing what this writer can do and what this this world is all about. And after that, like it's still that, like it's still absolutely on that level, but it's not your first time tasting it. You know, your that your first introduction to like holy shit, this is amazing. <laughs> so, Empire of Silence is that like first high that you're chasing. So, if you don't know anything about Empire of Silence, um well, you clearly didn't watch me and Alex's live shows, <laughs> but um this is an epic space opera that I think fans of Red Rising will absolutely love. Actually, I did a video about like should you read the Sun Eater. So, I'll leave that down below as well uh, if you're interested in that. But um suffice to say like this does everything right. This is everything that I want out of a space opera. It has incredible world building, incredible main character to follow. It has some like those Red Rising vibes of a sort of more archaic social structure, but placed in a far future. It does have something that Red Rising doesn't really ever tackle, at least so far, and that is alien life. And it handles that so anthropologically, which coming from me, high praise indeed. And it was just, as I read it, I mean, while I was just like enjoying the story as a reader, the entire time I was also just sitting there going like, but from a craft standpoint, like the way you've thought this through, the way you've built this out, the way that you've paid attention to all this detail, I'm just like staggered from a technical perspective. I think it's a rip roaring, can't put it down story that is intense and dark and dramatic and mind bending and expansive and just, just amazing. I highly recommend this series and Empire of Silence the first one is just like, wow. And the number one book of 2021, I'm sure you've already guessed it, is um, The Wisdom of Crowds by Joe Abercrombie. This is the third and final book in the Age of Madness trilogy. It is also the last book that we have that is planned, that is scheduled to be in the world of the first law. He has indicated interest in writing more in the world of the first law. The way that Wisdom of Crowds ends, it certainly leaves seeds for future stories to grow. But right now, this is all we've got and all that we are planned to have. And this is the first book that Abercrombie has written that has made me cry. And not just a glistening single tear. I was ugly crying. I joked that I would cry when I read Wisdom of Crowds because it was the end. And I mean, that that's sad, but that's not why I was crying. <laughs> Holy shit. It is, I mean, I think it's the best thing Abercrombie has written from a writing craft perspective. I mean, I have an intense love for the original trilogy uh, that I don't think anything could ever really supplant. But like, it's inarguable that as a writer, from a technical standpoint, he has gotten better and better and better. And the new trilogy is as tight and as polished and as just uh, lean and completely like perfect as it could possibly be. I don't think that I could possibly argue that the original trilogy is 
from a technical standpoint, better than the new trilogy. The new trilogy is like peak Olympic performance. And then the third, each book got subsequently better. A, a Little Hatred, I was like, holy shit, I'm, this is the best thing I've read from you so far. And then Trouble with Peace was even better. And I was like, that's ridiculous. And then Wisdom of Crowds was so good and it made me cry. And I just, I, I mean, I have a whole review for it on my channel. Leave that link down below. I also interviewed Joe Abercrombie, which was low-key the best thing of the year. Uh, so I'll leave that link down below too. It's a third book in a trilogy that is also like the 10th book in an ongoing world. So I can't really say too much about it except that way to stick that landing, sir. I was nervous going in because sticking the landing of any series is difficult. It's impossible for me not to have high expectations because I hyped it for myself so intensely. And it still managed to surpass my ridiculously high expectations. So hats off, chef's kiss. You're the goat. I just, wow. Wow. So those are my top books of 2021. Let me know in the comments down below your thoughts and feelings about my thoughts and feelings. Uh, let me know if there's any books on this list that you have read, that you want to read, that you you hated and think they belong on a worst books list, or that you were surprised that I didn't have on this list that you expected to see. Whatever you want to let me know. I post videos on Saturdays, other random times as well, but nothing Saturday. So like and subscribe. Join my Patreon if you feel so inclined. And I'll see you when I see you.